and years. So it's this is this is our life. Yeah. Nice. Well, so let's go back a little bit. Okay. Um, so you, you started a studio called Mobtown with your wife. Yes. What what happened there? And uh, I, I mean, I mean, you've told me a little bit before we started the interview about like, you know, how that led to where you are now. So maybe just like walk us through that real quick because it's an interesting story. Sure. So we lived in D.C. for years and I came from radio and, you know, I, I don't want to say it was a dead end job, but it was like there really wasn't I couldn't get anywhere else where I was and I couldn't get, you know, a higher salary. So eventually um, I just said, screw it. I'm getting out of this. I'm going to get a government job like everybody else does in D.C. Um, And then, you know, I got the salary I always wanted. And Emily also, she worked for the State Department. I worked for DOT, Department of Transportation. And that was great for two, three years. She did it a little longer than I did. But our souls were just like destroyed and it was just it it was just it was a hellhole. We hated it, mm. and we just wanted to do something that you know we loved. So we sold our house in D.C. and with that money of selling the house, we moved to Baltimore and built a studio, and you know had the money from selling the house to live while we were building the studio. And then we worked out of that studio for about twelve or thirteen years. Successfully, I mean, it's one of those things. That was the other thing I wanted to circle back to is something that I learned from school was slow growth. That was that was what I learned mm. in um, uh, sort of the business side of everything was slow growth. Uh, what I learned was you don't want to grow too fast because if you grow too fast and become too popular, eventually that popularity is going to wane and it's going right. to be nothing and you're just going to be, you know, a flash in the pan. So that's that's you know maybe that has some something to do with the success of my work and my business is in that you know I I consider myself like a working engineer I'm not working with you know Grammy nominated um nominated or Grammy winners all the time like some engineers do um you know I work with you know whoever wants to hire me kind of thing um right so right slow growth you know I if I have a 6% increase from one year to another like that's great Um, But every year we had slow growth. Um, So, you know, we we had a good business, but we ended up losing the building we were in. And because of that, not really knowing what I could do and figuring out where we wanted to go, we decided to go overseas for a year and sort of, you know, reconvene and just kind of figure out what could be next. And I, I did a little work overseas, but a lot of it was just, you know, Raising the children, homeschooling them, and checking out every freaking museum in Europe. It was amazing. It was amazing. Wow. It was so educational for the kids, obviously, because we were homeschooling them. And and for me, I mean, I'm a World War II buff, so it was like fascinating going into these bunkers in Croatia. And oh, wow. you know, we we took a weekend trip to Berlin, which was fascinating, seeing the flak towers, like it was it was amazing. It was it was a, it's a trip that like never could be reproduced, or you know we never could do it again. But you, like did the four hour work week thing. You like right. with your whole family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So yeah, we did that, and at the time, more and more people were asking me to do mastering, and not necessarily you know work with them in a you know record your band, produce them, mix it, etc. Mentality, and that was fine with me. I you know. I love working with bands. I love working with bands that are really devoted to their craft. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's n- I, I think not where my heart is per se. Um, and and I mm. s- sort of I, I've made like a soft transition when we went away to doing more mastering, and then I think it just kept growing, and more and more people were asking for it, and I was like, hey, this is a pretty awesome thing i had some great mentors like alex salt and dan coutant and bob katz uh mm. on on those forums that we're all on and it's just being in the mastering world is you know i don't want to diss on the recording and production world but and maybe it's not even necessarily comparison but the people who master mastering engineers in general are just so helpful and and it's it's a different community than i was necessarily used to when i was working in production in production it seems like a lot of you know people are more cagey about 
you know, how they got that drum sound or, you know, how, how they, you know, got that emotion out of a, a vocalist, you know, people mm. kind of held that to themselves as like trade secrets, but I felt in, in mastering, it's like anything goes and no one had any qualms about, you know, saying, Hey, this is what I use to get that sound or, you know, right. You know, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah. And because like mastering has this like, you know, connotation of being the, you know, the the dark art, the the mystery, you know, in the in the music, you know. Right. Right. Which I I mean, I I, I have Bob Katz's book, so I read it. (laughs) It's fascinating. He's he's a great guy. Yeah. So smart. So smart. But so, yeah, even that book just is giving giving away everything. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's it is like the book that is the book on mastering. Yeah, I have two copies of his book. I have to I have to confess I bought that book cuz when I got my record mastered in 2012 or 13 I don't remember I just didn't like the first master so I had to learn everything about why I didn't like it. Oh, well that's good. <laughs> I went, yeah. I went back to the mastering engineer and sat down with him and we redid it together. It was like an interesting moment for me as like a engineer. I was just like, "Why don't I like this?" Like this like I like he he definitely knows why like this maybe what he's doing should be better, but I still don't like it better. You know what I mean? It was like a yeah, and the, the bottom line was I I just wasn't very good at mixing or recording yet, um, and what he did made sense, but it d- wasn't working with my aesthetic because it just changed it into a new aesthetic. So Correct. It was, it, and I, I only have that understanding, you know, a few years later, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the process. That's amazing. But it's amazing you knew that and you took to education to like you know empower yourself to understand the language and figure it out. Which is what I yeah, find cheers, fascinating. Man. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I love ch- I love chatting with mastering engineers. Uh, everyone's like, yeah, they. I, I think it's like a cool journey. I don't know. Absolutely. I yeah, guess, yeah. And I remember. I'm intrigued by it. I remember yeah. being in a band, um, working with this guy Bob Wolf in Virginia, and getting my ma- uh, record mastered with him. Um, this was a record I played drums on and also produced, and I remember sitting there on that couch and watching him do what he did. And it was just, it was so fascinating. I was so enamored with like every small movie made. And I was so focused on what he was doing. And maybe at that point, that was that, that aha moment that I was like, wow, this is what I want to be doing. There was something so calm about it too. Yeah. Sitting in like a nice room that sounds amazing. And like doing those nuanced, like little moves at the end of the record. Oh, totally. And, and, you know, there were, there were certain parts about it too, where, I remember he asked me, hey, could I get a new mix of this, you know, with the bass up or the bass down? I don't remember what it was, but I remember it was the bass. And there was just something about it where, like, I wasn't offended with him saying that. Like, I wasn't hurt about it. It was like his goal was to make the music the best it can be. And if there needed to be a mix revision, that's what it would get it there. And and that maybe, yeah, I don't know. There was something about that moment that I guess – sort of set that foundation for, you know, how mastering engineers really are in, in my head. Yeah, the communication. Yeah. I mean, that that's like one of my favorite things about working with a, a mastering engineer is like if I'm working on a mix and I send it to the mastering engineer, they could give me a bit of feedback and help me just get the mix to an even better, even better spot because, you know, they're listening at a more, you know, macro level than I am at that point. Absolutely. And they could just be like, I, I mean, I already told this story once on the show, but like I was doing a mix and I sent it over to a mastering engineer and he said, uh, hey, like, you know, it's missing a bit of 2K in the vocal. I was like, 2K in the vocal? And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I just popped it up. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was that's missing it. that presence. Well, the, and I mean, and that's like, the, the amazing thing about a mastering engineer is being that third party listening to it for the first time and understanding what the song needs. It's like you can only listen to the song the first time once. Right. And it's like yeah. you once the song's done, you can't go back and listen to it for the first time. Right. Yeah. So so is that part of your mastering process, just like having a your first listen and just getting a vibe for everything? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, and there are a lot of... I, so I primarily work with producers and mix engineers. Um, I'm working less and less with directly with the band. So mm. a lot of the times, I'll, I may hear the song as the song is getting mixed. So I may hear either a rough mix or, you know... a the first iteration of the mix so that if there's any issues going on with it, I can give them feedback before they finalize the mix. So I would say 50% of the time I'm doing that with my mix engineers and um, producers, but other times I am hearing it for the first time. And yes, I'll listen to the the whole song or the whole sequence of songs um, for the first time by themselves. And that's all I do. I turn the monitor off. 
I listen and I'll often take notes either in my phone or sometimes I'll write it down on paper depending on my mm-hmm. mood. And yeah, you just listen and get the vibe for the for the record. Love it. So what what happens after that? <laughs> you guys take me through your mastering process. Right. Well, I mean, lots of things. You sort of – you hear it and as you're hearing it, you hear where it needs to go or where right. I feel like it needs to go. And and oftentimes I'll talk with the the mix engineer about, you know, what their goal with this song or record is. You know, what what do they want me to do to it? Do Do they want me to do – be kind of hands off and just kind of, you know, do quality assurance and, you mm-hmm. know, just give a little glue or do they really want me to like get hands on and like sculpt it? So it's two very different paths you can go down. And and sometimes there's, you know, something right in the middle. But um, a lot of it with me is, you know, finding I like to do the the sequence first where like I line it up and, you know, do all the crossfades and get all the, the sequencing correct first so mm. that when I'm listening to it, it's already all like how you'll be listening to it in in sequence and so you'll listen to the whole record as a whole in sequence before you even touch like a piece of gear for the most part if there's like something weird that happens and i just need to like find where that frequency is so i can like take a note i'll like pop in the mass lack and get a, a a narrow cue and like figure out where that frequency is and you know see if that small adjustment um makes a difference and then you know then but i generally don't stop the record um, I'll just let it keep playing. And if I miss it, then I'll just come back to it later. But I, I generally, I like to, you know, hear the record as, you know, uh, a listener would hear it. Right. Yeah, because you're, you're listening for the consumers, basically, right? Like, you're the final step exactly. before the consumers get, yeah. the, get the record. Exactly. So it's that, the last step, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, how, like, how heavy, like, are you all about going out of the box? Do you stay in the box ever? Any, like, tried and true, uh, you know, pieces of gear that you pretty much use every time? Yeah. So most of the time I'm out of the box, at least for what I call just, like, the prints, like, when I'm doing my my big changes. And then once it's out of the box, I go back in, and that's just for sequencing, like, when I'm resequencing the record and, you know, rendering and um, wow. final limiting. But most of the, the moves I make, for the most part, are outboard gear there's i mean there's a couple plugins like soothe which like there mm-hmm. just is no analog um there's no analog analog to it um right of course it's um it's 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 just this you know amazing plugin that does what it does um there's some transient shapers that i use that are not in outboard gear formats the isotope has one that i really like um but for the most part yeah i'm, I'm outboard gear all the time there's there is one one engineer I work with who I've found that he really likes a dangerous compressor and his ear is so tuned that anytime I try another compressor, like he can hear it. So I don't even bother anymore. Wow. Like I just know <laughs> like I, I have a parameter and I have to work with it and that's fine. That's how it is. But <laughs> yeah, I trick him every once in a while, but he catches it every time. That's crazy. Yeah. I can't I can't even imagine being it. I feel like mixers like often like I don't know, like if I'm giving feedback to a mastering engineer, it's like I'm like trying to read their mind of like what they did to my mix to make it sound <laughs> the way it sounds now. To reverse and engineer like, it. I know, and it's 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 probably not a good thing to do. <laughs> but sometimes you have to do it. Yeah. I don't know. It's like one time I was like I was trying to figure out why he overdid so- like a uh, the mastering engineer overdid something I mixed and I and I was I was like, D- I think you, I mean, you took out too much top end, or you like added this t- too much darken, and like the, you know, whatever it was, you saturated it too much in yeah. three hundred, and, <laughs> and like, it doesn't even matter because like I have no idea what the guy did, but it's, I guess it's fun to guess. Totally, yeah, yeah. So when you were working with this mastering engineer, were you in the room with him? No, or? no, no. Okay. No, no. I have, I haven't done an in person mastering maybe since my own record. Oh wow. Um, so I'd love to get back in the room with the mastering engineer and see I know. It again. Once this COVID thing is is done with, it would it'll, it'll be fascinating for you, I would imagine. Yeah, all the processes are are awesome. It's great to see other people work. And um, yeah, you know, we talked about this even before we started. Maybe we could talk about collaborating because I love getting to see what other pe- how other people work. And I feel like, I mean, that's part of the goal of this podcast. I mean, a yeah. lot of education online is because people just don't. There's not as much in person, you know, for good and bad. Like a lot of stuff is happening on the internet, so you got to kind of get new mentors, right? <laughs> like right, and uh, meet people on the internet. But there, yeah, there's nothing like uh, seeing people in real life. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, the my, I mean, 
they may disagree, but, you know, Dan Kutan and Alex Saltz, who 